Welcome everybody to Trek Zone Tuesdays and as we have done for the last few weeks we're talking science with Dr Brad Tucker, astrophysicist in Canberra. Brad, uh, happy Tuesday. Yeah, how's it going? Mate, it is bitterly cold here in the uh, south of Brisbane this morning. <laughs> How do you define cold? Well, at the moment the Bureau app is saying that it's 12.9 degrees. See, I was hot yesterday because our high was 15. <laughs> that sounds like a heat wave. <laughs> it was. Everyone's like, what's going on? We don't have snow falling in Canberra. Um, yeah, it was really balmy yesterday. Um, I like it. I, I will declare that it got down to about two or three degrees overnight. All right, so I'll, I'll give you so. that. That actually can't, you know, that's a that's a real temperature. This is kind of one of the, I think it's an absurd thing still about Australia that I still like grapple with in the sense that like, you know, growing up in the US, yes, like you get hot. It's still warm in the southern parts of the States, but and, you know, bitterly cold in the northern parts. But I guess I never felt that Australia where you would, you know, it's still these absurd, you know, Darwin is still like 30 degrees. Um, yeah. And, you know, Tasmania is, you know, they're shoveling out from underneath some latest snowfall that they've had. Um, you know, it's just that appreciation that, you know, Australia is the same as the US. And so you just get all sorts of things just happen to be a bit closer to the equator. Something that's not balmy um, and, and isn't hot and terribly humid uh, is observing through a telescope at, at night and and i believe that uh at the moment or coming up this week some pretty good uh, objects to see uh, dust out the telescope yeah so jupiter we just passed what's called opposition and that is the point where like if you draw a line between the sun the earth and a planet opposition is when they're kind of in a perfect line so what that means is the planet is the brightest it's going to be because uh, planets are only bright in our sky because it's reflected sunlight. So Jupiter's been really bright. So kind of in the early evening, right after about sunset in the east, uh, that's Jupiter rising. And so even through a, a small telescope or a pair of binoculars, you can see what's called the four Galilean moons. These are the four moons uh, that Galileo discovered um, when he first used the telescope to look at a planet. Uh, and so it's kind of a great chance to see it. And so, you know, it, we have nice, good, clear winter nights here in Australia. Yeah, the solstice is on Friday, so the shortest night of the, or the shortest day of the year, longest night of the year is on Friday, um, which means there's lots of great chances to kind of see um, all these things in space. Well, something else that you, you probably need a bigger telescope, but something else that you can see in the night sky are dwarf galaxies. Uh, and astronomers have discovered inside a dwarf galaxy a dwarf black hole. That's right. So so we actually, the cool thing is, um, we actually can see two dwarf galaxies with our own eyes. These are called the Large and Small Magellanic Clouds. So these are on a clear night. So essentially when there's no moon in the southern hemisphere, you can see these two faint fuzzy clouds. Um, now there's lots of these dwarf galaxies. And so one of the things that people have been wanting to find is, well, kind of... When we see the big galaxies, we know there's supermassive black holes in them. So in our Milky Way, we have one that's about 4 million times the mass of our sun. Some of the other galaxies have ones billions of times the mass of our sun. But we don't see these in these kind of dinky small dwarf galaxies. Uh, and so recently, some astronomers actually discovered a very intermediate sized black hole. So something that's only about 10,000 times the mass of our sun. Uh, in one of these dinky galaxies. I love how it's a small, uh, it's a small black hole. It's a dwarf black hole in a dwarf galaxy, and it's still 10,000 10, right. times bigger than our sun. Only 10,000. <laughs> Only. This is a really fundamental part of black holes that we have we we haven't understood a lot of. You know, we see that was called a stellar mass black hole. So these are ones like 30 to 40 times the mass of our sun when a big star explodes produces a black hole, and we know those collide. Uh, we feel the gravitational waves, the ripples going through space. And so they create, obviously, something bigger, about 60 times the mass of our sun. But the question has always been, how do you get those really, really big ones? We've always thought that the black holes just keep colliding and growing together. But that's critical in finding one of these smaller ones, these 10,000 mass ones. Um, essentially, it's kind of like if you are to look at the black hole lifespan, we had the babies and we had the old adults, but we needed to find the teenagers. Like, we know you have to go to the teenager stage. You don't want to recognize it. You kind of want to just glance over it, but it's part of reality. <laughs> and so by finding this teenager black hole, and actually a teenager galaxy, because we think these dwarf galaxies are the younger galaxies, that eventually collide to the bigger ones is a very important state in the way both black holes and galaxies grow across our universe. 
one thing that I love uh, on CNET's reporting of of this discovery uh, is their last paragraph in, in where they say that um, it doesn't mean they're any less terrifying. Like even the youngest of velociraptors, they'll still tear you to shreds if you get close to one. <laughs> that, that, that is a very apt description. They're just as deadly. I think teenagers are even more deadly sometimes. <laughs> and, and, you know, you underappreciate their, uh, their capabilities. You know, they have a big role and creating and producing new stars. You know, we were talking about a couple weeks ago seeing the spinning jets swirling out of a black hole and mixing the galaxy. So black holes are an integral part of not only destroying things, but actually creating new stuff in a galaxy and how they grow. So it's kind of a, a nice, cool discovery where, you know, we're still learning a lot of black holes and our understanding of black holes is rapidly changing in the past five years. And this is just another piece. It is absolutely incredible. And something else that is incredible is the multi-million dollar Earth ground station that's going to be built uh, in just outside of Alice Springs. And it's going to be the first one of its kind uh, developed on Aboriginal owned land. That's right. With and owned essentially by an, ab, an indigenous group. So this is, you know, ground based observations, what we call, you know, essentially space traffic control, space situational awareness. It's kind of a big deal. We have lots of stuff up there and we need to know where it is so they don't crash into each other. We need to see how it moves and we need to make sure we can communicate with it. And again, you know, what we were talking about um, earlier, Australia is great geographically to do a lot of these things. And the better, the great thing about Australia is there's lots of places with very low population densities. And for radio telescopes, that means little radio interference. You don't want to have one of these stations right next to a big city where you have radios and electronics and all those sorts of things. So given that, I think it's something like 40% of Australia and the land is owned by Aboriginal groups, it kind of makes sense that they can have a big role uh, in this booming industry. And so this group um, and outside Alice Springs um, paired up with Viastat, which is a global satellite communication company, and said, yeah, we're going to build one on our land that essentially we control um, and be part of not only providing a, a critical thing for space, but be part of this big space endeavor. Dare I use the coined phrase, it certainly is a giant leap. Uh, not not just for, you know, uh, Indigenous Australians, but also Australia as a whole, that we're, we're really diving headfirst into the next generation of space exploration and, and space, in, in gen space technology in general. That's right. You know, that everyone is part of this. You know, when we were talking a number of years ago and, you know, the space agency was just starting to come up and there was this push saying, you know, there's billions of dollars. I think there was always this kind of idea, well, where does this money come from? I think people fail to realize there's lots of big business that will come and pour money into Australia to build infrastructure and do this. You know, it, it's the direct community outside Alice Springs that directly benefits from the jobs needed to maintain and operate it um, to the money paying for essentially land fees, essentially, because, you know, they're renting it um, to then getting profits from this company. You know, there's so many different things. You know, just last week when we were talking about launching rockets from Northern Territory with NASA, groups everywhere are starting to benefit and it's not the federal government and it's not just a certain university it's lots of different people and that's i think the beauty of australia is if you think about you know the us you know continental us and australia are pretty similar land wise you know there's lots of different things happening in the us so that means there's kind of going to be the same equivalent that's going to have to happen in australia so that means if you're spreading it around all over australia that means australia all over benefits and lots of different people as well. So I think there's lots of great business models um, that we're starting to see that are really going to start paying dividends and seeing this, you know, fraction of, of whatever $400 billion the space industries were starting to come to Australia. I think you and I need to come up with a business plan, uh, Brad, and we need to uh, get in uh, on the ground floor of this burgeoning yeah, space industry. It sounds like it, yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's money to be had. There, there is money to be had, and, you know, Australia has lots of open land. That's, you know, that's why that's why the, you know, the square kilometre array, the biggest radio telescopes can partially be built in Western Australia. People j always joke in of Australia that, you know, it's so desert-like and so few people everywhere that's great for space like you know, yeah. that's what we want that's why we don't put things in tokyo that's why there isn't space <laughs> things in new york because there's people and we don't like people <laughs> we don't like our technology around people i should say around sheep are okay yeah sheep are sheep are okay 
Kangaroos can cause them problems, but not too bad. Camels can be annoying. That's the other. That's the one problem Australia <laughs> has is camels around radio telescopes. But that's a different story. <laughs> Fantastic, Brad. Well, as always, thank you for talking science, and uh, we'll uh, check in with you again next week. Thanks, Matt. Don't forget, you can get early access to podcasts just like this one, as well as exclusive behind-the-scenes information by becoming a Trekzone member on Patreon. We're fast on our way to becoming a self-sustaining website, but we need your support. Become a member today and help Australia's unofficial home of Star Trek get even better. If membership isn't your thing, well, you can always keep up to date with Trekzone by following us on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter, as well as subscribing to the YouTube channel and podcast feeds. Leave comments, react to posts it all makes us feel pretty good on the inside brad's doing the social media thing too find him on facebook dr brad tucker and twitter at btucker22 or indeed next week right here on australia's unofficial home of star trek trek zone with 37 days to go until our vegas or bust tour begins including the awesome star trek las vegas convention book your tickets now